Today's video is a mad experiment in dialogue with you. It concerns your considered feedback and comments regarding the report I did on Saturday about Daryl Imray. He's the dude who owns a 2016 Isuzu D-Max, which has gone poopy in its trousers to the tune of five grand. The injector pump has failed and Isuzu Ute Australia has declined to offer him any assistance with getting it back on the road whatsoever. I'm John Cadogan from autoexpert.com.au and I get new cars cheap. Ooh. Australia only, obviously. Website. Card. Now, there's a couple of things I wanted to mention about that report, okay? I've only got Daryl's side of the story, but I certainly do have the email from Isuzu to Dazza saying, no can do dude, on the assistance front, and we'll get into that at some length in just a second. I want to refer to my notes here because this is a pretty important sort of topic for car makers and car owners alike, and it concerns the real culture operationally in play here in Australia. And there's a couple of things I didn't mention by way of advice to Dazza that I'd like to clear up now. Part number one is if they stand their ground and you're unwilling to go to court over this, definitely investigate the possibility of having it repaired independently because I think you'd be able to turn a $5,000 repair into, I don't know, two and a half grand pretty easily, like dealership repairs are extremely expensive. And the other thing I'd say is if you want to change the culture, what you've got to do is engage with the machine, no matter how unpalatable that seems at the outset. And by engage, I mean engage with the ACCC. There's an email address that I've got here, which is a simple all catching media at ACCC.gov.au. So if you've been reamed by a car company and you think it is manifestly unfair and you're not just bullshitting, like you're not, you didn't damage the car or you don't have buyer's remorse. If this is a legitimate complaint and you are a victim and you are not getting assisted, media at accc.gov.au. The ACCC has a new chair since March. Hopefully they will awaken soon and do their bit to change the culture in Australia among car retailers and car importers. We can live in eternal hope there, I suppose. But we'll get into the nitty gritty of all of that, plus your comments, some nutty and some very informed, well-considered ones too, I'd have to say, in just a sec. But first, this video is sponsored by Olight. There's a big sale today, Monday the 26th of September until Thursday the 29th, with discounts up to 50%. And if you are logged on when you buy, you're going to get a free i3e EOS in antique bronze, which is a solid little keychain or handbag light, depending on whether you are a dude or a chick. Not that there are strict rules with that kind of thing anymore. I'm going to highlight the Marauder 2 today and you can hold it in your hand but dude this thing is functionally insane when you max it out. Like that is rather a lot of light. <laughs> Think you'd agree. 14,000 lumens when you max it out and 850 meters of throw in searchlight mode. And dude, there is your search and rescue solution right there. Mind you, if you're a hunter, you should check out the Javelot Pro 2 hunting kit, which is also a big discount now, 35% off, and it has over 1,000 meters of beam throw. Anyway, the Marauder 2 is dimmable for use sort of up close and personal, and it has this brilliant spot and flood operational mode functionality as well. That 14,000 lumens is accessible in both spot and flood modes, and it utilizes two completely different LED systems. Marauder 2 fully recharges in two and a half hours by USB-C, and it doubles as a 54 watt hour power bank in case your phone or anything else goes flat. It fits in one hand, although it is quite hefty, and it's gonna wait patiently in your center console for you to have that inevitable flat tire in the middle of the night 
in the boonies. You can keep it charged up using the car's USB port, of course. The Marauder 2 is IPX8, waterproof and drop tested to one meter. And if you dim it down, it'll run for 59 hours straight like that. This thing is versatile and a dead set beast. And it's $138 off at the moment. Link in the description, plus a code for 12% off outside of the sale. And remember, I don't accept sponsorships from brands whose products I don't use or recommend. I carry an Olite Warrior 2 every day. That would be this one. And I have to say, it has been flat out awesome. And now this from you, if you happen to be a dude whose name, in inverted commas, is heavy metal. You said that absolutely nothing an owner can do could impact the durability of the fuel pump. What about if it was misfueled, perhaps more than once? That is, being a diesel engine and the owner has put petrol in the car at times. It happens quite often. Surely that will impact the life of the diesel pump. Not saying this is what happened in this particular case, but it is definitely possible. So I do see a possibility that an owner can shorten the life of a fuel pump on a direct injection diesel engine. <coughs> Think you'd agree for a fake named personage? That was a pretty well thought out question actually. However, with a name like Heavy Metal, I am conjuring up these images of mum and dad, you know, with the big hair and the studded leather jeans, Mr. and Mrs. Metal with the looks that kill, enslaved and afraid, of course, on the wild side and presumably it. Home sweet home, they desperately wanted a son, only ever previously had girls, 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 probably from all that smoking in the boys room. Same old situation, really. Decided to shout at the devil. Some would call it a primal scream. Went to see Dr. Feelgood over on the wild side. Took a bit of pill, too fast for love, and here we are with the sun, finally. Let's call him Heavy, they said. He can go and play out in the yard with Slash and Axel. Perhaps they'll have fun in the dirt. Well, goodness me, they do sound like rather the motley crew, don't they? the metals. And young Heavy, the firstborn son, is the proud inventor in that missive of a brand new word heretofore not seen in the English language, misfueled, M-I-S-S hyphen fueled, possibly by virtue of having all of those elder sisters, the girls, 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 putting, you know, ideas in his head about this and that. That could be a whole new genre of Australian servo now that I think about it, misfueled. The bikini servo, that could make a comeback in years that follow, possibly 2025, 2026, before they stop, you know, selling liquid fuels. I'd shop there, and you would too, you know. Sorry, honey, I haven't been home for a couple of days, had an incident at Miss Fuel. Nasty business. Anywho, too heavy, I'd say, let's talk about the burden of proof, dude, because the burden of proof is a thing, and... Anything could have happened to this car. It could have been misfueled. Somebody could have emptied, I don't know, a kilo of friggin' sugar down the tube. And that could be in suspension causing dogs and cats living together in the fuel system. But there's no evidence for that. And in fact, I'd suggest that the burden of proof here rests with the dealership and Isuzu Ute Australia if they want to deny a consumer law remedy. And instead, what's happening here is they're basically saying we are unable to help you because your vehicle is out of warranty. They're not saying because you abused it, because you misfueled it, because you didn't get it serviced on time, because he did get it serviced on time, and all of those things. I mean, this is a vehicle where the fuel pump has apparently, according to the dealer, just shat itself at six years of age and 120,000 kilometres. And if you are going to leverage your business, Isuzu's business, off uh, concepts like reliability and advanced engineering and durability and can take anything that Australia can throw at it kind of thing, then you do have to stump up when your vehicle fails unreasonably prematurely. So there's that. And I'd suggest that nothing whatsoever in Isuzu's response indicates that there's been any suggestion of misfueling or 
contamination or abuse or abnormal operation. And this whole refusal to assist is basically steeped in one concept only, and that is because the vehicle is out of warranty. And that is absolutely not acceptable. And the other thing I'd suggest is that when we look at the anatomy of a misfueling failure, all right, here's what happens. You've got a diesel. It's nearly empty. You pull over to get it refueled. You tip petrol into it by mistake. And only two things happen, right? Thing number one is that you realise that you've done this. It's like, oh, Jesus, what have I done? And you ring some dude who fixes that problem before you start the engine, okay? So basically, it just goes away on the back of a truck and comes back clean because they drain the fuel tank and the fuel system and they put diesel back in it. It didn't get to the high-pressure pump, so you're okay. That's outcome number one, okay? Outcome number two here is that you don't realise that you fucked up in this epic way and you hit the starter and the engine fires and it runs okay just for a little while and then there's kind of deafening silence because the high pressure pump which maintains the um, injector rail at that extreme pressure of whatever it is, 2,000 atmospheres or something. That's a really precise little device, okay? And it's got very hard, very precisely machined surfaces to deliver that pressure repeatedly. And without the lubricity of diesel fuel flowing through it, because petrol is nowhere near as good a lubricant as diesel those hardened faces, just the shit just spalls out of them and that creates this micro swarf that just goes like a stroke through your vascular system. Only in this case, it goes down to the little tiny holes in the piezoelectric injectors and clogs the shit out of them. And that is a flat out disaster. And there's evidence for that everywhere. And it's not the evidence that Daryl came up with, which was an intermittent warning light and limp mode. This is just the abject catastrophic failure to run, okay? And then they pull it all apart and there's absolute evidence that you've done it. Like the fuel system is full of petrol, the high pressure pump is in pieces, the injectors are all clogged. There's your friggin' evidence. There doesn't appear to be this evidence in this case. So let's move now to a dude named Cameron Taylor who makes some good points. Cameron goes, as a foreman slash senior tech who works in a dealership, I find it surprising and disappointing that the brand won't support this customer, especially in this instance when, yes, it is out of warranty on a time basis. However, it is still under the kilometre threshold, I would state with utmost certainty that the brands I work for would goodwill that warranty provided no abuse was present, i.e. perfect service history as in this case and no sign of farm sourced fuel. He means obviously contaminated fuel. If the customer is urban and never been near a farm tank, I see no problems with a goodwill warranty claim. Unfortunately, I have seen a lot of issues with farm fuel and would understand the rejection on that basis. However, that would be at the dealer's recommendation, which does not seem to be the case here. It seems to me that the dealer is fully supportive of Daza in this case, and Isuzu has vetoed this. Now, this concept of goodwill, that dates back to pre-2011, so it's been kind of out of date for more than a decade now, and it's time we just lost it. See, Manufacturers and dealers are required to provide warranty-like repairs, assistance, remedies, I think the ACCC calls them, if the vehicle fails prematurely. And that means if it fails to meet the durability expectations of a reasonable customer, when you take into account things like how much it costs, what it's intended to do, and what the seller says about it. Now, if you do get contaminated fuel, there's evidence, and it surely would have been cited by the dealer and used in Isuzu's rejection of Daryl's claim, okay? The evidence is, like, contaminated fuel is a foreseeable thing. Vehicles are expected to operate in an environment where the fuel is lightly contaminated from time to time, and this is, of course, why they have filters, 
in the vehicle and why those filters are subject to a service interval. And that's one of the reasons why you've got to get your car serviced on time. So they can check the fuel filter and see if there's water trapped in it or any other crap or replace it on the time and or distance basis and things of that nature. There's no evidence that this took place in this case, okay? Not in Daryl's claim, not in Isuzu's response. So once again, I'd suggest that the burden of proof here, if they want to say, oh, you probably got contaminated fuel, they'd want to stump up evidence of this contamination. And frankly, it's getting a little bit late in the process to just magic up this convenient evidence. At least that's how it seems to me. I want to talk to you about Corey now. Corey. Because Corey is a bit of a self-appointed expert who reached out on this as well and says, you always rabbit on about consumer law exceeding warranty, but good luck getting a court to rule a six-year 160K part. It's 120, dude, so only 33% out there, but, you know, my advice would be do try to keep up. 160K part is within the reasonable durability requirement. Seriously, where is the line drawn if not the warranty period? Well, the line is drawn by the legislation which sort of says the durability expectations of a, quote, reasonable consumer. Otherwise, we're just letting the manufacturer lead us around like, you know, with a ring through our nose and I don't want to live in a world where that happens. Corey goes on and says, the only reason the complaint exists is because the price of the repair. You think? Because if I got hit by, I don't know, a $5,000 bill wrapped in a bus, I'd be seeking a remedy too, particularly if I thought it was unfair. And so would you, Corey, I'd suggest. Anywho, if you think consumer law will trump Isuzu post-warranty decision, then how about you fund the legal proceedings for Dazza? Well, Corey, it might surprise you to learn that I'm unmotivated to front the legal proceedings for Dazza because that's not my role here. I'm a communicator. Dude, I'm a journalist. I'm reporting this story. I think it's got merit. I think it's got real merit because it paints some light into the very dark corner of how some car companies roll in Australia when it comes to owners with seemingly legitimate complaints not getting looked after in the first instance, which I'd suggest is what should have happened here on the balance of probability. Now, in respect of Corey, I'm sensing millennial. I don't know why. And what I'm doing here, Corey, is I'm advocating for regulatory reform. And I don't think we need new legislation on this. What we need is a new culture, okay? We need new enforcement of existing laws so that some companies whom I would categorise as the bad actors in the market are a little bit more shit scared than they are now about doing the wrong thing because they face penalties that make doing the wrong thing unpalatable. Many car companies are prepared to act like abject sociopaths to you, the owner of a vehicle, just because that means a better bottom line when they get on the friggin' Zoom call back to head office once a week. That's how this works, okay? Now, I'd suggest that not all car makers are like this. I made a list of the ones that I see acting really well in the marketplace, and in no particular order. They include Subaru, Mitsubishi, Hyundai, Kia, Lexus, and BMW. They all act pretty well when uh, an owner presents with a legitimate complaint. And Mazda is actually okay, especially since the recent reaming by the ACCC, and perhaps those two factors are related, who knows. But plenty of car companies simply are not. You know, And in March this year, there was a new chair appointed for the ACCC named Gina Cass Godlieb, okay? She has received numerous accolades, according to the ACCC, from organisations like Chambers, Asia Pacific, Legal 500. She's a lawyer, right? Uh, Who's Who Legal, Lawyers Weekly Awards, Beton Client Choice Awards, not... Um, not B10 Client Choice Awards. She's not that kind of lawyer. Beton Client Choice Awards and Best Lawyers Australia for her competition and legal expertise, they say. She was also a Fulbright Scholar at UC Berkeley from 1986 to 1987. So, Jesus Christ, she's as old as me. 
Who knew such a thing was possible? Majoring in US competition law, financial institutions regulation and securities regulation. And didn't that work out so well for America in the two decades to follow? So anyway, Gina is the first female chair of the ACCC. She's been in the chair as the chair since March. And uh, she's the first chick since it was established as an independent statutory authority in 1995. And I do hope she brings the three-phase cattle prod into the office every day because it would be nice if the organisation just got a little bit more sense of urgency and immediacy about it, woke up a bit more often and stood up for the little guy and the little chick, right? Because as a group, I know they don't act for individuals, but as a collective, it's individuals like you and me who need to be stood up for because of the fundamental asymmetry of doing battle with a car company. More power, more resources, more money. If they want to take you on over your consumer law claim, they can just fuck you over by virtue of the imbalance of this power. It's David versus Goliath, and David only won once. You know, on the balance of probability, he didn't come back for two out of three because he knew how the fight would go. And this is kind of that. So car companies and all other retailers of all other things need to be aware or scared or whatever the right term is. They need to worry about what will happen if they do the wrong thing. And I don't think there's anything like the right level of concern among the bad car company operators in Australia at the moment. So anyway, I think it's pretty absurd that the major components of a car are not designed to be reasonably durable for 10 years and 160,000 kilometres. It is not reasonable for major things to fail below that sort of time and distance period subject to you not abusing or neglecting the vehicle. It's just not. Now, I look at Isuzu, which is now offered with a six-year warranty for 150,000 Ks, for example. Daz's vehicle is only six years old, so there's that. Uh, Let's look at what Isuzu says about itself. Isuzu says they're, quote, designed to handle the harshest of Australian conditions. Presumably that includes just driving around as a family vehicle. You know, they also say, quote, with over a century of specialist engineering experience, the D-Max is more than ready to handle whatever you throw at it. They say, quote, the D-Max defines durability today and every day after. But sorry, get fucked if it's six years and your injector pump fails, even though your service record has been, quote, exemplary. You know, to me, there just seems like a massive disconnect between the marketing and the actual conduct of that organisation. I'll close out with James Goodchap now, right? James says, I sell new Isuzu trucks and can confirm the identical engine is fitted to the Isuzu NLR, NNR and NMR range, which has a six-year, 250,000-kilometre warranty standard. So there's that to consider as well. James goes on and says, if the Isuzu D-Max is spirit of truck, perhaps it could come with the same warranty. That's a pretty good point. It seems many manufacturers pull a fault code and instead of bench testing the part in question, they replace the whole thing at an inflated cost to the customer. I'd agree with that too, because if there is just a fault code being generated, then it would pay to do some investigation before just going, that'll be five grand. We'll replace that part. Like, what actually is the problem with that part? Because if the part is functional and something about its control architecture is misbehaving, then perhaps the fix is actually much cheaper than the five grand. But hardly any dealerships roll this way because it's a conflict of interest. Why do a cheap fix when you can replace an expensive part at the customer's cost? And I'm not saying this is going on in this particular case, but this is also endemic in the industry, right? Like, here's what happens. If a dealership says to you, oh, that's the injector pump, that's going to cost four grand for the part and a thousand bucks to fit, which is ballpark the quote that Dazzle was hit with. The dealership gets to charge its markup on the part, 
okay? So it's making a tidy wedge, just middlemanning the part to the customer, and then it's charging the premium rate for the labour. So if you're getting stonewalled on this massive bill by any dealer, then you've got to ask yourself, is it really necessary to replace that part? And if you can get it as a consumer law job or a warranty job, then the dealer doesn't make his wedge out of the part. And he doesn't get the same money for the labour either because there's a discount rate for the labour when the dealer does work on behalf of the importer or the manufacturer over here. The manufacturer only pays a fraction of what you pay for the labour for the technician and the dealer doesn't get his markup for the part. So there are commercial disincentives that amount to a conflict of interest to do the cheap fix for you, which is why if you do have an old car and you're in this situation, or even a moderately old car, like out of warranty car, there is absolutely no reason not to approach an independent repairer because the independent repairer's core business is saving you money. That's how they roll. They can look at a dealership quote and go, you know what, we can get a good quality third-party aftermarket part that'll save you X and our labour is much cheaper than the dealer's labour and I guarantee that this same repair at an independent repairer will be a substantial saving over what it would cost at the dealership. And just to put that in perspective, I'd say five grand at the dealership equals ballpark two and a half grand at an independent repairer. And they're not giving it away. They're making a profit as they should at two and a half grand, which kind of points out to me at least that if you pay the full freight at a dealership out of warranty, it really is rather a ripoff and your funding... I don't know, the dealer principal's next holiday in the Caymans or something or putting his children through uh, an expensive private school. What I'm saying is this is way above the actual cost of doing business.